Hi, Fast Fan. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Craig Lieberman, and I've been tinkering on cars since 1980. I've owned more than 40 cars in my life. Some were heroes, some were zeros. But never in my wildest dreams would I ever guess that three of my cars would go on to star in a motion picture franchise. My Supra, my GTR, and my Maxima all had starring roles in Universal's Fast and Furious movies. Over the next three years, I'd serve Universal as a technical advisor. I helped choose the cars, procure the parts, oversee their build, and support both production and post-production. I've got some great stories to tell, and that's why I created this channel. I hope you like the video. Let's talk about Hans RX-7. The FD3S Mazda RX-7, as most people know, has been a favorite platform of tuners for decades. Its high revving 13B rotary engine was unlike its piston powered rivals in many ways. In the late 1990s, of course, modified RX-7s were fan favorites at car shows around the world. We knew this when we made the first Fast and Furious movie. I told Universal very directly that if we were going to have the very best of tuner cars for that film, an RX-7 should be one of them. And we gave one to Dominic Toretto. For Too Fast, Too Furious, the franchise moved in a different direction, as we all know, but I was able to take the leftover RX-7s from the first movie and reuse them in the second movie for the character of Orange Julius. But in Tokyo Drift, an RX-7 would finally get the recognition and deserve to become one of the most spectacular cars we've ever had on set. And when Universal decided to put Han Lu, oh yes, Han had a last name, it was Lu, why, why not? It's Hollywood, what can I tell you? Anyway, this RX-7 broke a lot of rules about making movie cars. It's important to remember this. In almost all movies, the cars that you see on screen do not have crazy engines, full audio, video, and suede interiors. They just don't need to. If the movie doesn't show the engine or the interior on, in the film, it's just not an important part of the story, and so there's no reason to build cars with all that equipment. Because of this, most movie cars have the stock engines with absolutely no modifications except what might be needed to perform stunts that, stunts that we've written into the script. So generally speaking, when we're talking about movie cars from any movie ever made, there are very few performance modifications on these cars beyond an intake, an exhaust, and in some cases, maybe modified brakes or even upgraded suspension bits, depending on what kind of stunts we're gonna be doing with the car. And that's just the way it's been done for decades. But what made Han's RX-7 as special as some of the cars like the Supra from the first movie, the GTR from the second uh, movie, and a handful of others, is that Han's RX-7 wasn't just cosmetically modified on the outside. It actually had engine mods, it had a functional audio video system, and interior upgrades. And that is what separates Han's RX-7 from most of the other cars in the entire franchise. Since Universal purchased this car directly from Veilside, Japan, the modifications were actually already done by Veilside. So the Hero One car was actually built by Veilside in Japan for car shows. The car was on, actually unveiled at uh, Tokyo Auto Salon, I think in 2004, basically to showcase the company's Fortune Wide Body Kit, which they've already used on Mark IV Supers. And if you remember the Veilside Fortune Kit for the Mark IV Super, it made a big splash. Love it or hate it, it was recognized around the world. I actually visited Veilside back in 2002 as a guest of the owner, Mr. Yokomako, and RJ Devera and I were there for several days. At that time, his facility in Scuba, Japan was a giant showroom for performance parts, and it was sprinkled with some of the famous drag cars that Mr. Yoko Yokomako had built, including an Evo 5, an R32, an R34, and in the parking lot, it was another showroom. There was more than 150 JDM classics there. Many of them were Fortune wide body kitted Supers, of course, but the rest of the cars were classics. They had 240Zs, they had Celica GTs, they had old Cressidas, they ran the gamut, GTR Supers, and so forth. It was amazing. But today, his operation has been scaled down a bit, and the giant showroom that he was using in Scuba is now basically turned into a tuning garage rather than a showroom. It's more functional. But after Veilside's participation breathed new life into the company when Tokyo Drift came out and they got all that pop, uh, popularity, things were looking very bright. But fast, or rewind back to 2002 when, or 2004 when, when Tokyo Drift was gearing up for production, what changed everything is that the production team members went to Tokyo Auto Salon to get ideas for cars they should use in the movie. And once picture car coordinator Dennis McCarthy saw the Veilside RX-7, which was red at the time, he knew he had to have this car for Tokyo Drift. 
Dentist and Mr. Yokomako of Elsai Japan struck a deal and the rest is history. When we got the car to the America, the stunning red paint job was covered with a House of Colors Sunset Orange Pearl to create Hans RX-7. Dennis McCarthy said it was a damn shame to paint over the red paint, but as we all know, Universal wants what they want and they get what they want, and they wanted this car to be bright orange, and so it was. Under the hood, the RX-7 had pretty much every bolt-on part available for that car for that time period, so not much was needed. Upgrades already included the HKS T04Z Turbo Kit, an HKS intercooler, Apex Power FC controller, custom intercooler pipe redundant by the Veilside people, and a few other tweaks. There was no reason to get into the street porting or bridge porting concepts because these motors uh, you know, are expensive and it, it just wasn't worth the time or the outcome because that's not how the cars were going to be used. These cars didn't need to click off a fast quarter mile time or do top speed runs or anything like that. They needed only really to do donuts or drift one corner and they needed sound good, brake well and handle corners predictably. The exhaust was Veilside Titanium, the brakes were 13 inch two piece rotors and four piston calipers from a company called Rotora and Apex uh, N1 coilovers handled ride height to get that measured out right and handling. Wheels were of course the 19 inch Veilside Andro Evo 5s and were shot in 255-3019 Toyo tires in front and, two, and 305 2519s in the back. The interior mods had already been done by Veilside Japan for the Hero 1 car. And modifications include the Veilside D1 seats and other interior trim bits included the Sparco steering wheel, Sparco four-point harnesses, and a bevy of gauges to monitor the data. Because this car was built as a show car, it also had a bit of audio video equipment as I talked about. Had a Sanyo T1718 DV head unit, Alpine speakers, and an eight inch monitor in the left side of the dash, which was all the rage back then. Two Alpine 12 inch Type R subs were fitted in the back and the whole system was powered by Alpine MRV 450 amps as I recall. There was a single nitrous express tank in the rear tank, but I, I don't think they used it. But of course the Veilside Fortune wide body kit is what makes the car. The body kit actually makes the car almost a foot wider and, and also requires a ton of fabrication work in the wheel arches. For Tokyo Drift, a total of nine RX-7s were built, not including the Hero 1 car. We needed nine cars because of the stunt sequences that were planned and in consideration of the fact that there were a couple of scenes that would actually be filmed in Japan, which meant that we were going to have to leave some cars uh, back for that unit, All, even though 90% of the film were actually 90% of the film was actually filmed in California. And Dennis McCarthy said in a video many years ago about this car that the car was making 600 horsepower. No way, and I'll tell you why. If you look into dyno numbers of that period of TO4Z equipped RX-7s. And even with more recent tuning tricks and technology of today, I've never seen when I've never seen one make more than 425 horsepower. You can look it up for yourself. As proof of this, there was a dyno test of the actual Hero 1 car done after filming of Tokyo Drift, and that car made 305 horsepower and 256 pound-feet of torque. That makes perfect sense given the fact that it had been abused on set and the car was 13 years old or whatever it was at that point. As further evidence of this, on set, the RX-7 stunt cars had trouble doing burnouts or drifting because of the heavy 19-inch wheels and the lack of torque, but these, of course, we were talking about stunt cars would had absolutely no engine mods. In fact, it was such a problem that they had to shave down the treads on the rear tires to get them to brake traction, especially considering that the stunt cars, again, had no engine modifications whatsoever. Therefore, it's more likely that the Hero 1 car was making maybe 400 to 425 max in perfect shape, assuming they were using the proper fuel and boost settings and everything in tune. But this only applies to the Hero 1 car. Again, for the stunt cars, it is a completely different story. Stunt cars, again, had none of the power upgrades, and stock engines that made 255 horsepower when new were probably making about 200 horsepower 12 to 13 years later. Given the fact that they were 13 years old again, that's not a surprise. Nevertheless, none of this takes away from the car's appeal to fans. I actually spoke to Sung Kang last week, and he had this to say about the RX-7. It was one of the most iconic cars of the franchise. There are a handful of cars from the first movies that everybody knows and everybody recognizes. The cars from the later movies just don't stick in people's minds. Absolutely agree. Couldn't have said it better myself. So what happened to these cars? I'll tell you. Since nearly all of these cars were right-hand drive cars, they were Japanese spec cars, meaning that in America they could not be sold here 
due to America's 25-year rule banning imports. If you want more information, you're going to have to Google it. In America, basically, if a company like Mazda is already making and shipping left-hand drive RX-7s to the United States, private citizens are not allowed to bring right-hand drive versions of the car until they are 25 years old. There are no loopholes, there are no exceptions, and there are no workarounds. Universal brought these cars in on bonds as props. The cars had to go back to Japan after the filming in order to get those bonds released. And no, you can't do that yourself. In any case, after the movie wrapped, the surviving cars were sold to a place called New Era Imports in around 2006. I spoke to the owner of New Era a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that they were able to buy all of the undamaged Tokyo Drift cars after the movie wrap. Over the years, they've been sold and then sold and resold again. In addition to that, there were at least a dozen replicas of this car floating around the world, almost all of them in foreign countries outside the United States. The good news is, is that if you want to build one of your own, it's still possible. The body kits are still available, although they're pricey, about 20,000 bucks. And of course, the painting and fitting the kit will easily run you another 10,000 bucks. The wheels, if you can find them, will easily cost you 6,000 bucks. And if you're a hardcore fan, replicating the interior and the audio video should run maybe another 10,000 bucks. You may not find the exact equipment, but you can get close enough. Rebuilding the engine, because all rotary engines that are that old probably need a real build, rebuild anyway, right? And adding a T4, TO4Z turbo, the supporting bits will probably run you another 10 grand. So, with the price of a clean donor RX-7 running about 25,000 bucks, you're going to end up spending around 80,000 bucks to build an exact replica, although it would be slower than, uh, say, a stock Mustang GT of today's times, but it's still a legendary car. But this car also isn't about speed. It's about showcasing Han's skills with building cars. And since Sung Kang actually builds cars in real life, he's arguably the most hardcore enthusiast in the franchise today. In fact, Han's RX-7 is one of my favorite top three cars in the entire franchise. I feel it's left an indelible mark on the history of iconic movie cars, and the Han character will always be the symbol of what true car guys aspire to be. That's it for this time, everybody. Thanks for watching.